Hi everyone, I'm Claire Liu and I'm the CEO of Know Your Team. We make software that helps leaders avoid becoming a bad boss. And on today's episode of The Heartbeat, I have a guest who I have literally been looking forward to having on this show all year. So I have Jerry Colonna, who is an, ah, what's the right word? Famed, notorious, I don't know. I've, I've heard your name the so much, The notorious RBG. <laughs> I think so, something like that, right? Uh, but as an executive coach, and uh, you run your own executive coaching practice uh, called mm -hmm. Reboot. Uh, most recently, you published a book by the same name, uh, Reboot, and it's on the uh, on leadership and the art of growing up. And I couldn't put this book down. There's so much oh. to to get into on this. And then it's so funny. I have so many folks who've actually either been on the podcast, CEOs and executives, who've talked about this book with me, um, or, or 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 the audio book. And so. Just really, yeah, there's so much to respond to and to, and to get into with you there. But uh, prior to, to you being a quote unquote CEO whisperer, you were at one point an executive yourself, but have spent most of your career as a venture capitalist. So you founded Flatiron Partners, uh, which uh, I mean, for anyone who's in the tech industry, <laughs> obviously knows a Flatiron. And then also you are a partner at uh, JP Morgan's private equity branch so they're they're um yeah they're pe part of uh, jp morgan chase but i am um, i'm yeah i'm honored to have you here jerry and to kick things off with this question that i've well, been asking leaders. The question, can i just say thank you for having me on oh yeah uh, it's bet. really an honor and and i appreciate the work that you're doing in the world it's important thank you that means that means a lot to me thank you all right, drum roll to the question. So you don't know what the question is, but this is a question that I've been asking, yeah, for the past two and a half years to leaders who I, I respect. And it's what's one thing, or it could be a few things, that you wish you would have learned earlier as a leader? Oh, that um, that's both a, it's a beautiful question and it's, uh, it's one that um, I have an answer to right away. Oh, all right. Let's and do this. that is um, that you're not alone. Hmm. One of the most, one of the hardest things about being a leader is uh, really stems from the sense of isolation and um, the fact that um, I'm going to badly quote Shakespeare. I won't okay. know the difference. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in in one of the histories, Henry V, Prince Hal, who in Henry IV um, is kind of a ne'er do well character, who's just like totally irresponsible. He, in Henry V, his father dies suddenly, and he's thrust into a leadership position. He's mm. king, and he's immediately challenged by the prince, the Dauphin of France. And um, France moves troops into Calais, which is on the other side of the channel, and Henry has to raise an army and go defend English territory. <clears throat> and um, the night before the Battle of Agincourt, where uh, it's very clear that the English soldiers are outnumbered 10,000 to one. They're always mm. outnumbered 10,000 yeah. to one. Henry is walking through the camp, and he and uh, in a soliloquy, he says, among other things, upon the king, let us our lives, our debts, our souls lay upon the king. Hmm. O oh, hard condition, we must bear all. And I think one of the hardest things is the sense that it's all on our shoulders. Hmm. Um, and when we believe that we are alone. Yes. We wake up at three o'clock in the morning spinning. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we believe we are alone, we believe the stories that our minds tell us. You know, my infamous somewhat cuss-filled statement comes to mind, which is just because you feel like shit doesn't mean you are shit. And... Yep. Um, if I had only known that I was not the only one, hmm. the burden, the burden on my shoulders would be a little bit lighter. 
Whew. Jerry, you, I think, have touched on, I don't know, maybe the most existential <laughs> question for us as humans. Like, I know this podcast is all about leadership, but what it, what it honestly brings my mind to, it's actually, I think, the biggest thing I've actually personally changed my mind on uh, the past few years, five years, which is uh, I used to think that uh, people are inherently islands. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie About a Boy. And there's mm -hmm. like that opening montage with Hugh Grant. And he, I think he's quoting someone about, you know, every man's an island. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through a lot of variety of, you know, growing up and being sort of the, the loner, the odd person out a lot of the times, like feeling like, yeah, like you mm -hmm. can't really depend on anyone. And oh, my situation is so different than anyone else. No one really gets it. No one really gets me, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a shift to growing up and realizing actually the thing that makes us fundamentally human is our ability to connect and to have a shared experience. And that's in fact what makes whatever suffering or whatever pain or confusion or uncertainty bearable. And in fact, yeah. beautiful is the, the shared element in that. Uh, and so, so I, I, I receive that um, mm. beyond the scope of just the day-to-day -day of running a team and feeling like, oh yeah, no, it's not just, you know, when I'm stressed and running my, you know, running near your team as the CEO that, yeah, no, I know I'm not alone and my team's here and, and uh, you know, I've got peers and other co-founders, et cetera, who, who feel the same thing, but actually broader in life of we're all in this. We are all not alone. Yeah, we're all in the lifeboats, aren't we? We sure are. We sure are. Together. How, and, um, oh yeah, no, please. Yeah, I would just say that, mm -hmm. I would add that um, the fact that it triggers existential questions, it's not an accident. Yeah. Um, the reason the subtitle of the book is Leadership and the Art of Growing Up, the reason is that... Mm. <sighs> The process of becoming a better human, the process of becoming a, a better adult or the adult that we were born to be is hard and painful. And as I often say, it's why most people choose not to grow. Yeah. Because it sucks. And um, what what is beautiful about that relationship between the leadership challenges and the and the existential feelings that that you noted mm -hmm. is that we can use those challenges to complete that process hmm. so we so so it doesn't surprise me for example that you yes. said for the last five that you've changed yes uh if it's if if it would be okay i might suggest an additional word to yes. that verb changed. Yes. The word grow. Yes. So I've grown in the last five years. And in that growth, I've come to realize that community matters. It's everything. Yeah. yeah uh, well, uh, now, I'm an introvert and I want to honor all the introverts out there because yay, I am as well. introversion. <laughs> yay. Well, <laughs> not surprising. Exactly, right? Because you, because, because I imagine now, now I'm projecting onto you, so mm. reject it if it's wrong, no. that you enjoy the one-to-one. -one. Yes. It's where I right? thrive. Yep. It's where we thrive. And so um, um, can we be in the lifeboat together where we look across the lifeboat and, and Jerry says to Claire, hey, you okay? Yeah. And Claire says, yeah, I'm okay. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Whew. That was that was some rough seas, eh? Yeah, rough seas, and we're okay together. Let's 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 go be okay together. Hmm. So, you got me Jer going with your question. So, <laughs> I I mean, the questions you pose in this book alone got me going. So I'm uh, it's hmm. uh, it's symbiotic here. What um, or what I what I was so curious about in and also hearing your response is uh, having faced that learning or sort of noticed it, observed it and been like, oh, got it. How do you sort of keep that with you amidst all the changes in seasons and times and the flux of busy, conflict, c 
competing priorities, how do you not relapse or sort of recede into that shell admits how dynamic life is? That's the thing that I'm always curious about is we learn lessons as leaders. We say things that, or even people tell me things where I'm like, oh yeah, oh, totally, right? Lead from the front, show empathy, be honest. And the translation into action day in, day out, that always, that always, I think, you know, you, you put a, put a magnifying glass up to it and I don't know how, you know, how closely am I, am I living that out? How closely are others living that out? I, I, I'm always very curious as to how lessons can be internalized over time or if there are ways you sort of lock that in for yourself. So, um, and then also for, I mean, you work with so many leaders as well, like helping them, right? Like when they leave their session with you, Jerry, like how do they, how do they sort of keep that with them? So um, I'm going to answer the question, I promise. But first I'm going <laughs> go to go to a different to. place. No, no, no. You, you answer whatever you want. <laughs> the first thing I'm going to note is yes. uh, I can't help but, sort of take this stance. Yeah. What is the wish? So I'm imagining that that question comes from a heart place yourself. Yes. And I'm imagining that Claire at some point in her life heard something, was moved by it, a bit of wisdom, uh, tried to put it into practice on a daily basis, forgot it. Yeah. And then the magic moment comes of remembering that you forgot it. Yep. Now at that critical moment, what does the inner voice that is always judging Claire mm. say to Claire? That moment. What does that voice say to you? You should have remembered. Okay. So. How did you forget, right? Now, it's judgment. What is wrong with you? Or oh, I'm going to go one step further. <laughs> Yeah. You think you're going to talk about leadership? Mm. You can't even, right? You hear right. it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so notice in your body how the feeling is coming up. Mm. Okay. I'm going to project a little bit. Um, Go for it. Uh, were you a high achiever in school? Yes. Always getting the right A's? Always. Always fig figured out early on how to get the A's? <laughs> Always. Okay. So go to school at that. Okay. Because there's a very tight correlation between mm. high achievers and imposter syndrome. Yes. Okay. And imposter syndrome is one of the names for it. In the, in the book, I talk about the crow who sits on your shoulder. Yeah. Right. So if you remember from the chapter on the crow, one of the th very, very important things to, to, to acknowledge when that voice comes in, and I hear that voice in the, what's wrong with you? How did you forget this? Mm. Okay. One of the important things to remember is that that voice is trying to keep you safe. Hmm. Even though it makes you feel like shit. Yes. Okay. So we blow it a kiss. We say, thank you very much. Right. I don't really need the reminder that I forgot. <laughs> okay. Yep. And we let that go. Mm. So that's step one. Now I want to respond to the question, the underlying question, which is really about the art of growing up, which is really about the art of transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a really important and powerful word I would offer in response, and that is practice. Okay. Yes. It's why I call it the art and not the science of growing mm -hmm. up. Um, you will ha gain insight throughout your life and every single day you will forget every single day yes because you're human no matter how many A's you got and the question to hold on to is what do we do when we remember that we have forgotten right do we then pile on and beat ourselves up or do we say, wow, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. 
And see, the thing, the thing about transformation, the thing about the art of growing up, the thing about learning and growth is it takes time. Absolutely. And repetition. Yes. And that's the practice piece of it. Right? Um, I have a sitting meditation practice. Someday I won't need to practice anymore. I'll be dead. Right. I was like, maybe. <laughs> right. right? Because, <gasps> because the goal is the coming back to. Yes. You know, in Buddhism, so one of the most, yeah. that's right. One of the most important teachings is that, um, and, and the sutra goes something like this. If you spend 20 minutes intending to meditate, or you sit down for 20 minutes of intentional meditation and you, and you find that for the first 19 minutes your mind has been wandering, ruminating, hmm. spinning about the future, Yeah. but wake up in that last minute, congratulations, you've had a very successful meditation session. Right. Because you woke up. Exactly. So the short answer to your question is – to remember that it's all a practice and to remember that the practice is coming back to the insight. Yes. Not always focused on the insight all over again and again and again and again. I, um, I so appreciate that response. Mm. It is, um, first of all, you absolutely nailed why I asked that question, right? Personally, it's something I think a lot about because I think congruence for us as humans, it's the way we sort of, we conflate it with integrity. And when we think about sense of self and trying to you know, form a narrative for ourselves that feels right, that mm. alignment is always extremely important, right? So I always think mm -hmm. a lot about, well, how, how well is what I'm saying matching what I'm doing? And then with the leaders that we work with, whether it's in workshops or, you know, I run a lot of in-person training sessions through our software. I do, you know, hundreds of interviews like this. It's, um, it's a thing that comes up for a lot of other leaders too. It's like, I know this, like if you catch me at a calm emotional state, centered emotional state, like I know this and, and it is forgotten. So, and, and what is so amazing about what you shared is, is the, Almost like what is uh, what is most salient about that isn't the fact that you have to put in all this effort to try to remember all the time or internalize it somehow all the time. Because one, that's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. So I just love the acknowledgement like that's impossible. But mm -hmm. two is the fact that the actual value of that process is how you choose to show up when that happens. Mm -hmm. How do you choose to show up when you forget? Are you mm -hmm. hard on yourself? Do you pile on, right? Mm -hmm. Or do you, or you take off? Do you go? Do you get cu curious about your experience mm -hmm. instead of judgmental? Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, the, I love um, that. Studies have shown again and again that positive reinforcement is the path to true transformational learning. That wrapping the dog on the nose when it pees on the carpet does not teach it to not pee on the carpet. Exactly. Right. And so the same thing happens for our own mind and our relationship with our own mind. Mm. Wrapping ourselves on the nose is not going to teach us not to forget. Yeah. It's just going to exacerbate the reason we forgot in the first place, which is oftentimes a distraction, a reversion to our, our lesser self, our, our lesser angels of our nature. Mm hmm. Um, can I bring us back to one of the first points? I love you too. About? Yes, please. Um, there is an opportunity hmm. in that space where the the insight that was gained has been forgotten and now remembered it yes. that it was forgotten, and that opportunity is to give permission to the community around you to say with love and grace, "Hey, Claire, you forgot." Yes. Right. Uh, the brilliant hmm. poet um, and inspiration for me, the late John O'Donoghue. Ah, so has a, good. Has a He's wonderful poem called For a Leader. Hmm. And in it is one of my favorite lines, which is may, uh, may you be surrounded by good friends who mirror your blind spots. 
Yes. Right. And so one of the reasons community is so important is to help us remember that we're not alone. But another reason community is so important, especially in organizations, is to empower our organizations, empower the people around us to say, hey, we forgot. Exactly. With that kind of whispered love. Hmm, I love that. Whispered love. Yeah. You know, I know your heart and I know your intention. Right. And so even when you get crosswise with your own intention, Hmm. I get to stand shoulder to shoulder with you and say, Claire, I think you dropped something. Yeah. That's all. Yes. I find it... um as I sort of like dig through my own tendencies of why is it so hard to quiet the crow, right? Why is it so hard to have that voice be a whispered love of a voice versus a critical, demanding, you should, why didn't, right? And and you talk about this a bit in your book, which is we as leaders, or maybe I'll just speak for myself, I know I have a tendency to do this. Um, We so fuse our sense of self Mm -hmm. with the job. Mm -hmm. And so poor quote unquote performance, whatever that even means in the job, Mm. or not doing something that you would see is, is the right things to do on the job, cuts at the value that we see ourselves as people. And yeah. for me, I, fi- I find that to be, I find that to be, I'm, cu- I'm curious, wh- you know, with whether it's, you know, your own process of remembering, mm-hmm. forgetting and remembering, forgetting and remembering, uh, mm-hmm. and, and then working with all the leaders. Do you, do you see that as, as true? Yeah. Or are there oh. other, other currents that pull stronger, do you think? Uh, yeah. I, I would yeah, just love so, to dive into that. Like, I think that conflation but, of identity and work is just like, it's always an interesting one. Yeah, so um, you're 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 linking two important concepts, and you're showing you're you're experiencing a cause and effect that's powerful, and I believe is true. No. And and that your first question is why is it so hard to quiet the crow? Yeah. And the second observation is that perhaps it's so hard because the merger of existential identity with the endeavor. Exactly. And by the way, this is true for everyone in all positions, yes. whether it's true. You know, William James said, and I'm paraphrasing him, that it is not failure that defeats us or annihilates us, but it's when we attach our sense of self-worth and meaning to accomplishment of the goal and then fail to achieve the goal that we are annihilated. Okay. Right. And so <clears throat> two things I would say. There are two, in addition to the merger of sense of self as a reason for the crow. There, uh, and, and, and so let me speak about that for mm. a moment. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to call you out again. So Please. one of the things about high achievers. Yes. Is that um, we very early on begin to get external affirmation of our self-worth. Yes. Right. And so we know we did well when mommy or daddy hangs our spelling test on the refrigerator. Yeah. Everyone tells us we're good. Exactly. So impressive. Oh, that's so great. And and it it, it is it as a parent, I will tell you, it comes from a loving space. It comes from a pride filled space. Um, But there's a there's a negative undertone to it that can come across as I'm only lovable if I get the 100 on the spelling test. And then we live in this comparison world, Mm. social media, Mm -hmm. which um, uh, is relentless. (laughs) And um, and so perhaps this was true for you at 21 or not. um, But I have some very close personal people in my life who spent some of their years in college saying, but everybody else, like that one's, they're going to win a Nobel. And that one's going to get, and it's this constant. 
right? Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why. So it's it's that merger of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. It's the I, and for entrepreneurial leaders, it's the merger of the entire entrepreneurial endeavor with yes. self. Yes. Right. Um, I could, as a coach, I'm always on alert. My ears prick up when someone says, it's my baby. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> no. Okay. Babies yeah. are babies. That's right. what babies are. Right. Okay. So there's that. Yes. But there's another more insidious and really confusing reason why it's hard. Hmm. And that is, goes back to the first, one of the first things I said about that voice. That voice is there to keep you safe. It has been there since your earliest days. It's very, right. So when we sit and we start to notice that we have this constant internal dialogue with ourselves, mm-hmm. constantly judging ourselves, which again, I named as the crow. The first impulse is to try to beat the crap out of the crow. Get it to shut up. Shut up. Yeah. Problem is that trying to shut off parts of ourselves, or there's a great line, which is um, turning off those parts of ourselves is like trying to get rid of a headache by chopping off your head. Oh, yeah. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. (laughs) And so what you really want to get to is a place where you understand the benefit. That that voice is. And in your case, for example, that voice did help you achieve. Mm -hmm. That voice did put you in that seat on the other side of that podcast microphone, having a dialogue with someone else about issues that are really important to you. Sure. Sure. So thanks. But the the jujitsu move to make is, but I don't need you anymore. Right. Because I'm an adult. And I got this. I'll take it from here. Yes. I love you. But please stand down. Right. Does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. It's the difference uh, between, you know, listening and obeying, right? It's the difference between understanding and internalizing. Like you can hear it. You can see it. Um, It's like, uh, you know, there's some book I read that made an analogy of thoughts being, um, you know, you can see the trains going past. You don't have to get on the trains, right? That's a, that's a Pema Chodron teaching. That's who who taught it to me. Yeah. Uh, The Buddhist nun Pema Chodron. She's the best. Uh, Yeah. Her writing is amazing. Teaches uh, to see our thoughts as trains pulling into the station. Exactly. And then we wave the goodbye when the train There we go. It's definitely Pema then. She's, she's, I mean, it's... (laughs) Yeah, it's revelatory. I, I, um, I think, or one, one thing I'm curious to, to maybe I'll hold up a mirror to you, Jerry. How about that during this conversation? What has been the, the hardest thing for you to, or the thing that you actually rather you forget the most and come back to the most and you have the hardest time sort of quieting that crow? Oh God. Um, there are a lot. Hmm. And thank you for that question. It, it, it's really uh, helpful for me. Um, but but it happened earlier this week. Hmm. Um, it's um, as I've been describing it lately. Um, one of the complexities of my childhood resulted in um, a structure I referred to as good boy, bad boy. Hmm. And uh, there's oftentimes a, um, a wish to be the good boy, which means that the threat is to be the bad boy. And um, it was actually just this past weekend I was doing some solo camping, uh, well, with, a, with one friend, but, but a lot of solo time. And I realized that, you know, in chapter nine of the book, I open up by recalling myself musing on the question of, am I a good man? Hmm. Have I been a good father? Have I been a good partner? Am I a good CEO? Am I, am I a good man? Because I identify as male. And 
I realized this weekend that that is just a grown up version of that early setup, which is to wonder if I am worthy of love. Yeah. Because in order to be worthy of love, safety, and belonging, I must be good. You must be good, right. It's not inherent. It's, it's, it's earned. It's not inherent, right. Well, that's the belief system. That's the belief right? system, exactly. Which that's the mental model, right. That's the it's mental wrong. model. It's completely right. contrary to the teachings of the Buddha. Right. Right. So you asked, what is it that I forget that I need to remember all the time? Yes. It's that um, I can live beyond the good boy, bad boy setup. Mm. And, um, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot about the next book and hmm. yeah, that may be part of what I'm playing with is the, is the yeah. notion of what exists beyond that construct. Yes. Right. To me, it, um, it recall, and you know, we have a tendency to do this when we're interviewing people. I'm I, I, for myself, right? It's we, we immediately, or I immediately think, oh, what am I? You know, what do I see myself in? In, in hearing that, which is uh, goes back to something you mentioned about this this seeking for approval, right? Mm -hmm. Like any time we try to assert value or define how good am I that, or am I being valued? It's a subconscious seeking for for approval and so a thing i try to ask myself and i'm curious if you do this a version of this for yourself or for your clients is i ask who am i trying to impress right now like let's sure. get real like who's what's like what who I'll, 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 right? I'll give you something that i was i was yeah taught by one of my coaching instructors early on mm -hmm. um and and it produced a lot of shame Mm. So it's a it's what I refer to as a cringeworthy moment. Oh boy. And cringeworthy <laughs> moments are great moments of learning. And it was very, very early on in my coaching career. Um, and as part of the coach certification process, I had to record sessions with the client's permission and then play them back at, with a with a senior coach, with a master coach, and talk about what was going on. Mm. And a lot of times, uh, Martha this coach, Martha Lasley, would say, okay, what's going on right there? What, 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 what are you doing right there? And she gave me um, a tool, which I, I used for a long time and probably should get back to it, which was she made me write on a sticky note uh, the acronym W-A-I-T. Okay. Wait. Hmm. And what it stands for is, why am I talking? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I need that everywhere in, <laughs> in my little home office here. My goodness. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and it's huh. um, what I, one of the many things I love about that is um, there's a, a sharp, effective, loving humor in it. Which yeah. is the best way I learn. Yes. Like, oh, yeah. I should ask a question and shut up. <laughs> as a leader yep. and as a coach. Absolutely. It's it's so funny. So we run we run workshops and, and trainings on um, receiving feedback well. And one of the hardest pieces of the framework that we offer is talking less. It's so hard. It's so hard. We, we feel like we have so much to say <laughs> and to justify and to work through and to process. And it is so, so hard. On the topic of questions, though, Jerry, I was very intrigued to know what, what's been the hardest question that you've had to ask yourself? Or what uh, is a question that you always come back to sort of as a self-check? Well, the, 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 the question that really began um, changing my life mm. was how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? I heard you share that, I think, on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, when, I, when my psychoanalyst started teaching me the underlying belief systems behind that, Yes. And the structures. It was like 
it was like I took the blue pill and saw the matrix. Mm. Right. Holy fucking shit. I've created this whole world. Yeah. What did you see? Yeah. And like it, and, and, um, and, and the truth is every single day I forget that the stories I'm telling myself are in fact stories. And, but when I remember, it's usually after I, I've had an, an opportunity to be able to turn around and go, okay, what's my part in this? Not, why does this always happen to me? Mm-hmm. Or why can't I figure it out? What am, why, why, am I, yeah. why am I messing this up so bad? Yeah. Yeah. You, you hear that crow? Mm-hmm. It's relentless. Right. The choice of word for complicit in that question, right? How am I complicit in the conditions that I may may not want to have? Tell me about why that word in particular is so helpful in well, asking a, this question. Why not, you know, how, how, why am I, how have I not caused this? Or what am I doing to cause this? Or what am I doing to contribute to this? Or how, like, there's a lot of words you could use instead. Yeah, yeah. So um, thank you for asking for that clarity. Um, I like the word complicit because we're accomplices in our lives. Hmm. We are not uh, the sole actor. See, yes. part of what the crow, crow does is it either denies our agency or attributes all problems to us. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is not is neither of those. Exactly. Right? Yeah. We have agency. And we're not 100% responsible. Right? But we live in a very childlike black and white world hmm. where either we're entirely the victim or entirely the perpetrator. Yes. Neither is true. Yes. Right? So complicitness means I am going along with the act. I'm the driver of the getaway car and the bank robbery. I'm not walking in with the gun. Okay. So I'm an accomplice. That's important because when we start doing that inquiry process, one of the first things the crow will do to protect itself is to start telling ourselves what a jerk we are for having belief systems in the first place. Yes. Right. And so that's why that word complicit is really important because it, it sort of breaks the bond of that. Yes. Now, the second half of that, the, the, the words are, are, are important. The words, I, the way I frame it is I say I don't want these conditions. Now, what I'm trying to do there with that part of the question is to make a distinction between what I say out into the world at large and what's really going on inside of me. Mm-hmm. What you actually want. Oh. I say I don't want to be so busy, but boy, does it feel good to feel like so responsible for everything. Yeah. Important, it, valued, needed. Important, value, especially if I get my yeah. value from external circumstances, exactly. I'm going to be, I'm, my calendar is going to be filled. Yeah. Right. And so by, by making the distinction, I hope to encourage an acknowledgement that we are often uh, subject to multiple different motivations and intentions mm -hmm. because we're complex human beings. Yes. And so that's why those words are so important. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That is such a powerful, powerful question. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one I know that I'll be, be walking away asking myself. I also was thinking, this is a little bit sort of, it's related, but maybe maybe shifting gears a bit is I've always found it really interesting in you know studying leadership now for you know this past ten years and there's so many different frameworks and models that people use and then you know you also sort of can look at more um, I guess how would you describe it whether it's religion or other sort of more formal philosophies around life and I always found it very interesting that some of the most popular takes on how you best lead is about the reduction of ego and sense of self. 
And Mm. to be a good leader, you need to be thinking about everybody but yourself. You need to be in service of something. Uh, You know, Buddhism in particular is all about, you know, reduction and separation of of that, you know, yourself from that sense of self. Um, And what I find so interesting about that is that it directly conflicts uh, a lot of times what seems like the reality of the way we're supposed to do our jobs as leaders, which is that we have to have answers that people look to us for direction that um even our sense of self in some t- in some ways defines a company or a brand or even sets what value should be for a team just by what we personally value and so i was i've always been curious about that tension of sort of the philosophical notion of okay separating sense of self or making sense of self smaller and, and then just also this noticing of like how many problems emerge from tying a sense of self so tightly to the role that you do and, mm. and i just wanted to riff on it with you and, and sort of pick it apart do you do you see a similar tension in the day-to-day of the things that are required of us as leaders sort of demanding that we show up as very cemented in our sense of selves and putting that forward uh do you even believe that sort of uh sort of separation of that sense of self or reducing ego is sort of a path to go to 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 becoming a better leader better person human wanted to yeah just poke on that so, that concept with you so here again i promise to come back with a direct answer but i can't help myself i love it I love so I wanna, the, let's do it i'm gonna I'm going to reflect two words that I heard. Mm, yes. Or two phrases. Required of us. Yes. Demanded of us. Who's doing the demanding and who's doing the requiring? Hmm. Who requires that you have all the answers? Probably I'm asking me. You directly. Yeah, oh, probably oh. myself. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let's just pause here for a moment. Mm hmm. The basic premise of your question is the observation that there is a mental model around leadership, which is that a leader is the one who has all the answers. Mm -hmm. And immediately, in relating that observation, you externalized it. Yes. Other people expect this of me. Right. I love that observation. Yes. Okay. And then when I poked at it, you immediately went to, oh, actually, it's internalized. Now, mm. it's an internalized belief system that you you weren't born with it. You learned it. Exactly. Right? So, so there is a belief system in our society that the one with all the answers gets all the toys. Mm-hmm. The one with all the answers gets the A in class. Oh, high achiever again. Here we go. Now. You're linking that in your question to this question of uh, the, 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 the diminution of ego. Now, mm-hmm. there is no getting rid of ego. None. None. Right. Even His Holiness Dalai Lama has an ego. Right. I mean, it's the his, way we make sense of the world, right? In many ways. His relationship to the ego is different than yours or mine. Right. But he has an ego. Right. Okay, he happens to have a very funny and humorous relationship with his ego. He can laugh at his ego, but there's no getting rid rid of the ego or the self or any of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a charlatan's game. Hmm. It doesn't exist. And when when we pursue that, and we fail, we give energy to the crow, right? Who tells us what our jerk we are, right? Okay. So let's put that to the side for a moment. Now, when a leader of an organization takes the position that they're supposed to have all of the answers, they are inadvertently using the organization to assuage their internal inner critic. Yes. Okay? And there is nothing that someone who has positional or role power that can they can do worse damn it there's no worse damage that a pers- person of positional power can do than to inadvertently 
unconsciously use the organization to deal with their own demons. Exactly. Okay? And so we have to question that first assumption, which is that the, that the, the person who has uh, uh, all of the power needs to have all the answers. Now, let's just get really pragmatic about that. Hmm. I can't see a faster obstacle or a deeper obstacle to scaling in an organization than that belief system. I would agree. So the, the, what Peter Drucker yes. says is that the, the leader is best who asks questions. Warren Bennis says a leader's job is to ask questions. Yes. Right? Open, honest questions, not setups. Well, have you given thought to doing X, Y, and Z? <laughs> That's not an open, honest question. No, leading, yes. Leading. Directive, yeah, it's a That's directive right. question. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So the, the real work is to go at the internalized belief system and realize that my job as a leader is to encourage the development of people who can answer my questions. And my job is to actually ask curious, open, honest questions from places that people may not have even seen because I'm using my open, holistic perspective mm -hmm. to try to see things that others may not be seeing. Absolutely. In many ways, it's why, to tie it back to what we touched on earlier, Jerry, is um, it's why that word complicit, I think, is so important is because pretty much everything we've identified as external problems or situations we need to figure out, it is a, as you mentioned, a externalization of something internally we're trying to figure out for ourselves. And so the complicit is unknowing, it's unintentional, mm -hmm. but it's contributing without even realizing mm -hmm. that it's there. And mm -hmm. I... And I know that this is what your entire coaching philosophy is based on. So the book talk, talks about, right? This radical self-inquiry is the mm -hmm. only way we, mm -hmm. we get past that. Mm -hmm. If everything that we see as problems is an externalization of the things that are going on inside, then how do we ask the right questions to figure mm -hmm. out what's going on? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the tool we use is to always ask ourselves those questions. And, you know, here again... Mm -hmm. We will forget this a thousand times a day. Yep. And then we come back to it. Practice. Practice. Mm. Well, Jerry, I, um, I can't tell you how formative even this you know, short 40-some minutes has been mm -hmm. in helping me practice that, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that the process of forgetting is, in fact, the process. That's the work. That's, and it's the reward. Mm-hmm is to mm -hmm. go through that. I, mm -hmm. um, I recently, uh, someone had, had told me um, recently about how they had learned that, well, when I am away from my company mm -hmm. and I'm focusing on myself and maybe seeing an executive coach or working out or go, you know, going on my runs or going to yoga, doing the things that invest in myself. I, you know, I used to think that's about, oh, okay, getting time away from the business, getting time away from all the things and so that I can show up and then be super on on my day to day. And he realized, he was talking to, I think, a mentor of his and he's like, no, Claire, it's actually, it's completely flipped. Mm. So the time that I am actually giving back to my team, giving back to my organization, my company, it's when I'm actually by myself. It's when I'm mm -hmm. focused on myself and asking those hard questions and doing, taking the rest and the time and the breaks to recalibrate and reflect. Mm -hmm. And the times that I'm receiving, mm -hmm. the times I'm actually feeling and getting something is actually when I'm with my team. Mm -hmm. That's when mm -hmm. I'm receiving. I'm giving mm -hmm. when I'm by myself and I'm receiving when I'm with my team, like instead of the other way around. And I, I, I found that, that structure. Yeah, and that was a really powerful reframe for me in thinking about how whatever problems that I'm facing, to your point, right, they are versions of things I'm trying to figure out for myself and that the ways that I actually can give and show up is, um, yeah, when I've let those go. 
mm. and show up with mm. more space. So thank well, you. You're welcome. And, and, you know, in closing, I, I would just encourage that, you know, reiterate something I said before, which is that mm -hmm. those of us who are privileged to have power um, have a moral and ethical responsibility to be vigilant about mm -hmm. the ways in which our nonsense hurts other people. Yeah. And um, the more power you have, the more responsibility you have. As Peter Parker's Spider-Man's uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility. I was just about to say there's a reason <laughs> uh, Stanley sort of right. immortalized that. It's uh, it's because it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, but here's 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 what I find refreshing though about this, Jerry, which is that we have the answers. Then, right? Amen. They're all here, right in here somewhere, right? Like it's not some unsolvable, unfathomable thing that we have to go out and go on some long trek to figure out. It's like actually no, it's it's some commitment to, to wanting to figure out what those answers are. It's to asking the right questions, being vigilant about asking them and then doing the work and practicing. It's doing the work. Yeah. It's doing the work. Um, uh, you know, there's a line I use in the book, um, which, which, uh, comes from something. One of the, the folks who came to one of our leadership retreats said, which is, you mean there's no playbook? It's like, <laughs> Nope. I mean, there are plenty of people who write playbooks. Oh yeah. I'm, but really, I don't think that's how life works. No. It's, uh, amen. <laughs> it's not how life works. Thank you for, for helping me, for helping so many others who are listening to this podcast feel like, all right, we are not alone in this whole thing called life. You got it. Appreciate it. It Jerry. was a pleasure to, to be on. And thank you for such thought provoking and fun questions. You bet.